Okay, welcome to the last session of talks for PyCon AU 2018. First up this afternoon, we have Dr. Christopher Swenson. Uh, Dr. Swenson is a professional open source cupcake, and he is going to be talking to us about Colossal Cave Adventure in a browser. Let's give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, Colossal Cave Adventure in Python in the browser is my talk. Um, if you do want, there are slides available on GitHub. I'll leave this up for a second in case you want them. I think those are for a slightly older version of this talk, but it should be pretty similar. Um, so what is this talk, though? Uh, Colossal Cave Adventure, I'll get into all the details on exactly what it is, but it's a text adventure originally written for a mainframe back in the 70s that I decided to take a nice journey, and I wanted to learn how it worked. And so I ended up implementing a PDP-10 simulator and a Fortran 4 interpreter in Python so that I could run it, because I wanted to run the code. Um, I think anybody should be able to get something out of this talk, um, whether you be a programmer or not. Like, a lot of the code that I'm going to show is in Fortran 4, which nobody here, including me, knows. Uh, so I presume that maybe somebody does, but I don't. Um, uh, and I have some alternative titles for this talk, uh, being lazy in the hardest way possible. So again, like the ultimate goal in computer science uh, is to be lazy. I don't, I don't know if you know, if anybody else has ever realized this, but computer science is the science of laziness. It is really like, boy, there's these hard math problems over here that I'd love to solve, but I'm so lazy. How about I develop a computer to solve them for me? And thus computer science was born. Uh, so being lazy in the hardest way possible um, also, it is a programming turducken, uh, or we could call it something like full stack Fortran 4, I don't know, uh, because it does take up the whole stack. About me, um, I'm currently at Twilio, previously at other companies. Um, occasionally, I help out with Beware, which this is built on top of some of the Beware stuff, and I'll get into that. Um, and I sometimes run a conference called PyDX in Portland, Oregon, um, and I like programming. Uh, so the motivation for this is when I started at Twilio, the company, we typically do uh, like a little beginner project uh, to, just to get familiar with the Twilio API. Twilio is, is uh, generally known for SMS. Uh, so you can use it to like programmatically send and receive SMS messages. And so I was like, I want to write a game. Like this sounds like a nice little fun thing. Like what kind of games can you write with SMS? And I thought, well, why don't I just take an existing text adventure and port it to work with SMS? Like text adventures, especially the early ones, work really well with this paradigm because they're very, you know, command response based. They're, they have typically have very short sentences that they interact with and a very limited vocabulary. Like this would be, these will fit perfectly in text messages. Um, and so I was like, well, I'll pick the first one ever because that would be cool because I always wanted to learn more about how it works. Uh, the first text adventure ever was called Adventure, um, sometimes called Colossal Cave. Uh, it was written in 1976. I think the first source code that we have for it is from 1977. Um, and it was probably the first text adventure. I think there's a little bit of you know, historical dispute on that, but it basically is. Um, it was incredibly popular and influential. It was ported to dozens of systems. Practically everybody who had a access to a computer in the late 70s and early 80s probably played it. Um, and it you know, spawned Zork and all sorts of other things. Its, it's influence is known to this day. Um, it was originally written in Fortran 4, like I said. If you want to play it right now, I have the phone number up. There's a, an Australian number that will work only if you have an Australian phone. It does not seem to support SMS with anything else. Um, and then there's a US number as well that I believe does support international. So if you want to text either of those numbers and start playing now, you are welcome to. This is also available on the web in the browser, and I will talk about the magic that makes that happen uh, near the end of the, of the talk. Uh, so Adventure has this sort of iconic beginning, and I, I literally, my goal with this was I took the source code exactly as is. I don't change a single byte on it before I run it. I just want to run it exactly as is. And so it contains, you know, errors, suggestions, complaints to Crowther, who is Will Crowther, the original author. He is still around. I don't suggest you ask him for help on this. Um, I think he's retired now. Um, and yeah, it, like all of the typos and all are just preserved in this forever uh, because I wanted it to be pure. Um, this is what a PDP-10 looks like. It's basically the size of a room. Um, 
Yeah, so PDP Fortran 10, let's talk about it. This is like the core of the talk is about how much fun Fortran 4 really is. So we're talking, we're talking all the good stuff from, from programming languages past, like all caps, no recursion, no indentation. You get line numbers sometimes. Spaces absolutely don't matter. You can take out every space in the program and it will still work somehow. Uh, uh, it is made for punch cards. Uh, the source code I have is an ASCII text file, but definitely made for punch cards. And tabs are six spaces. An unconventional choice, but you know there weren't really standards for these things back then. So um, it looks something like this. Uh, I had to write a special highlighter that understood this, you know, bizarre variant of Fortran 4. Um, so it sort of like makes a little sense when you learn to learn to read it. Like any line that starts with a C means comment, um, and then typically you tab over to start actual programming stuff. Uh, you can declare some variables just like you would. It's almost like in basic um, or something like that. Uh, all the 300s and stuff, those are variables. So you uh, sorry, uh, array variables. So you can have arrays of stuff. Um, it doesn't, there's not really such a thing as a type in Fortran 4. Types, those come later in programming. Everything's an integer. Um, although it does have a concept of a real number, but it's not clearly defined how those are specified in the system. But basically everything is an integer. Um, and then also you see like the one, two, three, four, five, those indicate that this is a continuation of the previous line. Um, that's just how they did it. It made sense on a punch card, and on a punch card it would probably have come out looking a little bit like this. Uh, the, the documentation I have is not exactly clear on which of these is correct. Um, if the tab gets you all the way over, or if it's a tab and then that, um, I think it probably looked closer like this on the punch cards. I would love to have a punch card of the source code. That would be cool. Uh, but there's like a little line continuation column that you would put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in. Um, and, then, and then it starts in the code. So I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit of the initialization routines and the playing routines. Um, so we're going to read the parameters. So there are, there are nice comments in the code sometimes. Uh, and then you get like, you know, you're, it's like kind of readable. You get like weird things like dot any dot zero for not equal. Uh, Fortran 4 kind of predates using symbols like equals, plus, minus sometimes. I mean, you get plus, but you don't get a lot of, uh, a lot of the other ones, XOR, there's no, a lot of those characters just weren't present on keyboards back then. And so they sort of had to make do with dot any dot, dot XOR dot, that kind of stuff. Um, and then data is actually just a really neat way of doing almost like a Python list, Python list comprehension. Um, so you can basically initialize a, an array in one go using that little list comprehension there, like way before list comprehensions were a thing. Um, loops are kind of strange. So the way you do a loop in Fortran 4, it's not like a while or a for or anything like that. You do a do and you specify the line number that is the last line number of the do and then the condition of from and the condition to, and then it kind of runs through the, those lines over and over again. Um, you don't really get things like recursion or uh, you know, things like that in Fortran 4. It doesn't support recursion. So there's sort of a limit on this, but you can do multiple do's embedded in each other for a multiple for loop. Um, but this, this is pretty straightforward. The, the parentheses i means just an array index. So this would be a bracket in modern programming languages. Um, but this doesn't really, Fortran doesn't typically differentiate that well for that. Um, so whenever you want to read user input, so again, it's going to be reading from usually a teletype uh, back in those days, sort of like a giant typewriter. You could type in things and it would print out like one line at a time. So in order to actually read from either the user input or from a tape drive it would have attached, you tell it to read, you give it the device number, and then you give it a line number with the format that you want to read things in. So G, of course, stands for integer. Um, <laughs> And so you want to read a single integer into iKind. Um, weirdly enough, like you do see things like G in some other languages. Like I want to say, like the struct package has like a lot of weird, and they, they sometimes share some of these. So uh, history goes back. This is a really cool feature called a computed go to, which I kind of love. Uh, so what you do is you take iKind plus one, and then you use that as an index, a one up index, into that little array there, and that tells you where to jump. Uh, so if it's a 1, you go to 1,100. If it's a 2, you go to 1,004. And if it's greater than the length of the array, who knows? Could go anywhere. <laughs> Exceptions, not really a big thing quite yet until Java. Um, so don't do that. Uh, if you want to read in maybe slightly more complex data than just a number, um, you can give it read. You can give it basically a list comprehension sort of and tell it to read into that. And this is saying I want to read 20 ASCII uh, words into an array. 
um, also one number. Read one number and then 20, uh, 20 ASCII words. Um, and A5 is sort of like the biggest word that will fit inside an integer, um, which will make sense in a minute. Uh, you call subroutines by calling, by just say call. Uh, if you pass in a parameter, it can sometimes, that will sometimes indicate that it's going to return a value in that. Uh, it depends on how it's declared. Um, but yeah, so you, you don't differentiate those in any way. There's no pointers or anything like that. Uh, so this subroutine there uh, looks like this. And this, this will determine that, yes, you want to return something in that YEA up above because you set it to 1 and set it to 0, depending on the logic. Um, there's nothing too complicated in here. These are the actual, like, real, this is the real code here. So, you know, junk, junk, these are all great variable names. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I uh, don't have much to say about that. You have to be very explicit about returns, but this isn't so this isn't so weird. Other than you can't have recursion, you can have them call each other, but then you know, get in or speak could never call yes. That would be very bad. Um, so what's that weird like five like character thing that I mentioned? So pre 1980 or so, there really weren't a lot of standards for how big words were. Like word meaning the thing that a computer can understand in one register or so. So you often, nowadays you'll see 64-bit words, uh, sometimes 32-bit if you're like an ARM and things like that. Uh, but back then, they used just whatever they wanted. Uh, and so DEC, the Digital Equipment Corporation who makes the PDP-10, did 12, 36, and 32, depending on which system you were in. And the PDP-10 happens to use 36-bit words. And because it came out just after like ASCII did, they decided to go ahead and most, mostly use ASCII for it. And it turns out that 7 into 36, you can put five things in, right, with, with, with long, one little bit left over on the end. And so they have this standard for packing characters into an integer so that you could work with ASCII strings as if they were integers. Um, and that's how you did strings back then, just arrays of numbers. And why does this matter? Well, it turns out that the program tokenizes its input itself. There's no standard library in, in Fortran. You have to do everything yourself. So this, this code is probably my favorite code in all of it. It's like a master class in like how you got around machine limitations back in the day. Like, all, I mean, this is almost completely incomprehensible. Uh, with, I spent a long time looking through this to try to figure out what in the hell is going on. Uh, but like the data M2 line there at the top, quote means octal integer, of course. Um, <laughs> so those are octal offsets because it didn't have hexadecimal. Hexadecimal wasn't really a thing that they cared about at the time. So you have octal offsets, and what it's doing is it's looking for spaces in that. It, it's trying to determine if this is a two-word argument or if it's one word. And like it's trying to chop out spaces. It's basically doing like a split in a strip in Python, uh, but doing it like purely numerically. So it takes like a little seven-bit mask and it tries to shift through the uh, all of the integers uh, in there and try to see if it's a space by checking if that one bit is set, you know, because a space is like 0x20 or something, right? Uh, so it's, it's basically going through and doing all of that logic using multiplication and uh, whatnot. It's, it's really bizarre, and, and I just love it. Uh, and it's really, really hard to emulate all of this correctly. So, <laughs> OK, that was, that was sort of it for all the weird Fortran. I love this. I could almost give a whole talk just on this function here. I think it's the best thing. Um, so all right, so how, if you saw all this code, how would you go about you know, making a compiler for it. Like, there are Fortran compilers out there, and there are some, like, Fortran 77 compilers out there, but not really any Fortran 4 ones. So I sort of was left to my own devices. And normally, you have this sort of formal process you would learn in, like, university, where you scan the text into tokens, you take those tokens, like words, and you try to make a syntax tree. Maybe you would, like, optimize the syntax tree to eliminate dead things. And then you generate some, like, machine code or C code or something from that to run. But um, that sounds exhausting just looking at it. I don't have that time. This is for a work project that I only really had a couple of days on. So how do we do this like the quick and dirty way? Um, the quick and dirty way in Python especially is you just use split and strip just everywhere you can. Just split and strip everything uh, to sort of get something looking like tokens. And then you sort of just hack it until it kind of works. Like, and just go line by line and just start executing. And like, don't even bother with syntax trees and all that kind of stuff. Um, I really like using named tuple. Named tuple is a really handy class in collections, I believe, uh, that lets you build classes really easily. So if I want to have a line class and I want it to have a comment, 
a label, whether it's a continuation and a set of statements, then I can just build that class right there. It would be the equivalent of like a fairly large class statement um, that has that. It's, it's a shortcut for building really nice utility classes that you can then sort of build your compiler out of. So I sort of just use name tuples as my kind of grammar uh, to build my compiler or my interpreter in this case. Um, pretty straightforward for how that kind of works. And then read in the data, read in the tape drive. There's a tape drive file as well. You have to read in that it has all of the text in it. Um, and then combine all the lines because those continuations will trip you up otherwise. And then parse the lines. The parsing looks sort of like this. I think I actually do, this code might be out of date because I think it is supposed to be times six. Um, but I think the code version I have assumes it's times eight. It doesn't really matter a lot. Uh, it just makes things a little bit simpler. And so I have to go through and strip out comments and all that stuff and do labels. Um, yeah, so parsing it into lines. The execution is very straightforward. It just uh, essentially executes each statement as is, and then it just has a little cleanup logic to make sure that we're not in a do loop. If we're in a do loop, we have to pop back out of it um, at some point. Uh, and yeah, and the execute statement just looks at every little statement, checks to see which name tuple it is, and just executes it right then and there, just saying, is this, a, is, this a, you know, is this an if statement? If it is, then I'm just gonna evaluate whatever it gives me, and if, it, if it's a Boolean or an integer, then I just use Python's logic to determine whether or not it's true or false um, and then kind of continue on my way. And the rest of it looks pretty similar to that. Uh, ditto for expressions. If it's, the expression is an integer or is a string in Python, I can just go ahead and return it. If it's an operator, this is sort of implementing an abstract, abstract syntax tree because if it's an operator, then I sort of have to like take apart the sub-expressions and then check those. So I have to do a little bit of cleanup around that, but pretty straightforward. Um, and then this is how you parse statements, and this is how to check, you know, converting an, if something is an if statement is if it starts with the word if. And then you have to do a lot of really weird things to take care of all the edge cases with parentheses, which I won't go into. Um, type is also really weird because of the ASCII formatting and stuff like that. Um, so I won't go into that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really it. That's, that's the interpreter itself. It's just basically start the subroutine and just execute forever. Uh, you have to read from the keyboard. Again, that's not super interesting, so I'm gonna skip that. Uh, so the three interfaces we really need, though, are tape, teletype input, and teletype output. Tape is just a fixed uh, data file that we're going to read in. Teletype input could be anything like SMS, and teletype output could also be something like SMS, but you could also do a browser interface um, or something else in the future. I have some interesting ideas on where this can go. Um, so I decided to use SMS, as I said, so I wrote a little Flask app that runs on Heroku. Um, and I structured it so that the internal state of the interpreter is serialized and saved per each phone number so that you can continue playing the same game over and over again. Um, I'll go through that briefly. Like, it's just a little cute Flask app. It doesn't do a whole lot. Um, it just takes in an incoming message from Twilio and parses the from, parses the body, cuts it down to 20 characters. Uh, it checks in the database if it has state for, for that phone number. Um, and then if, it, uh, if someone requests, you can, I will delete anything we have with their, with their number in it. Somebody requested this feature, and I was like, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Like, we can go ahead and just delete everything if someone requests that. Like, I have no, we have no need to keep this data. There's nothing personal in it, but I also don't want to keep a database of people's phone numbers. Um, otherwise, we go ahead and start a new game. Uh, we start that in its own separate little thread because we want to execute it asynchronously and pick up uh, whenever it's finished. So we start that asynchronously. Uh, wait for it to sort of boot up, so we wait for it to start waiting for input. Um, it's gonna t it takes a good two seconds on Heroku, I think, for it to really like churn through enough Fortran code to, to respond to users, and it has some stuff for getting input. Um, and then, yeah, it goes ahead and gets the state from it and uh, does output, and then it has to now save the new state that it has, so it has to go and grab the state from the current interpreter and do something with that. Uh, which naturally, so this is, this is what the state is. It really is like a dump of the entire internal state, like all of the variables, all of the programs, all the, yeah, all the labels and everything like that, and then just pickles it, compresses it, throws it in the database, right? It's production, right? It's fine. Pickling is great. There are no security problems with pickling whatsoever. Uh, so, and you know, the entirety of your state is like 11 kilobytes then, which is more than the entire source code and whatnot combined. Um, so I, I could just reparse everything from scratch every time, but that would take a lot more time than just pickling the, inter the internal state and resuming it. So I, and I accidentally had written it to where this worked really well. So perfect. 
OK, so what about the browser? So that was the SMS piece. And where does this browser come in? So there's a, this neat little project called Batavia from Beware, um, which I have worked on a little bit. It is essentially, do I talk about this? It is a Python bytecode interpreter written in JavaScript, meant so that you can run Python code in the browser or in Node, sort of not quite natively, but with a nice little translation layer. And as far as I could tell, Batavia is Australian for battery killer, because it really just destroys your battery on your laptop. Um, because it's like so many layers of indirection, it's pretty great. Uh, and it technically works, which is, again, the best kind of working for, for my purposes. Um, yeah, so it is, it is good enough to run my Python interpreter and, uh, and the Fortran code for the most part. Like there's a few challenges that we have to come up through. So JavaScript and Python have, both have concurrency models. If you've ever done a lot of JavaScript, you know that JavaScript's concurrency model is really, it's like a giant soup of functions and callbacks, and it works. That's how it gets concurrency and how it sort of gets that asynchronous feel is that you just have so many functions running, and there's this big stack of them, and you run one at a time. And Python doesn't like that at all. Python is like, I want to execute this one function forever. And you know, maybe interrupt me, and that's fine, but you know, interrupt me very carefully, whereas JavaScript, you cannot interrupt a JavaScript function. That is a very bad deal. Um, so I just kind of hacked Batavia until it worked with this anyway. So I added, I added some magical callbacks into the middle of the VM, you know, for fun. Uh, uh, so, and it's still a little bit in early stages. It can only execute bytecode. It cannot parse Python, but otherwise it just, you know, technically works. Um, so there's a problem, though. Uh, Batavia is in early stages, and it can't, like I just said, it cannot parse Python. And I ran into a problem. So earlier I said name tuple is your friend. It makes your code very simple. I love name tuple. And you would think that like if you're dynamically creating classes, like this should be like a master class in like Python meta programming. You look in the source code and you would be enlightened because it's built by like some you know beautifully developed code. And it really is, this is a, this is like an abbreviated version of it. And the the key is the exec line. It basically builds a string with the class with the class in it. And then it executes it right then and there, like, and just like to hell with like metaprogramming or anything like that. It just it does it in like the way I would do it, which is <laughs> disappointing. Um, but unfortunately, this means it relies on the Python interpreter to be able to parse Python code, which we currently can't do. So I had to remove all of my beautiful name tuples to get this to work. But I got that. Um, you also get some really strange uh, conversion problems. Like for the most part, JavaScript and Python like understand numbers pretty well, and luckily JavaScript numbers are like 53 bits long, so that is fine for the 36-bit numbers, uh, and floating point numbers are barely used, so that's okay, but like Boolean types and things like that get kind of strange when you interact with them, so this one tripped me up when I was doing my programming, so here's a, here's a JavaScript trivia question for all of you out there. If you think you're a JavaScript master or even Python master, like uh, they do different things with this statement, uh, so one equal equal two, times minus one. Who thinks they know the answer? What, what would that output right now? No cheating. Zero. Zero. Good, good guess, but no. Minus one in Python. Uh, no. In, I think it's zero in Python. Uh, any, other, any other fun guesses? Like not a number or empty object? Like all sorts of fun things it could be, right? Uh, would you believe it is negative zero? <laughs> For reasons that still befuddle me to this day, uh, it is negative zero. Um, I, don't, I don't really fully understand it. Someday I want to understand why this is, because negative zero isn't really a thing in JavaScript, and it's really hard to actually get negative zero. Uh, so anyways, I had to like work around strange issues like that. Um, but demo time, so you can actually, again, go and visit this in the browser. I should have recommended that you go to it at the beginning of the talk, because it takes about 30 minutes to load. Because uh, again, there's JavaScript and Python and Fortran, just all kind of just loving each other over here. And just, you know, uh, let's see here. So I pre luckily preloaded it when I started the talk, though. Uh, I can show you what it looks like if you don't. Uh, Internet disconnected, never mind. Okay, well anyways, you can sort of see it goes through and executes all of these lines of internal state um, where it's kind of going through and executing all of it and it has to go through a parsing phase. I added a little progress bar so that you wouldn't like see nothing for 30 minutes. Um, anyways, yeah, welcome to Adventure. Would you like instructions? And I can say, um, no, I don't want instructions. And then you can see here that it's kind of gonna 
chug along in its little Python Fortran JavaScript brain. And you can see like there's it trying to like parse the, the input and determine where there are words and things like that. Uh, and then it's like, okay, finally we get to, you know, you are standing in a road. Uh, and then so now I want to enter the building because there's a building there, a small brick building that has stuff in it. And again, it's gonna just chug along in its own little merry time. Uh, eventually, I think we'll get to enter the building. Uh, uh, the, the code is also not particularly implemented well. Like, there's a lot of like giant if switch statements uh, where it probably could have done a little bit smarter about tokenization, but these were early days in programming. Oh, look, we have uh, some keys and stuff here, so we can you know, tell it to take food and take keys, right? Uh, and it'll eventually figure out what we said and, and do that. Um, and that's, that's basically it, so you're happy. Uh, you can text it again at those numbers, I'm happy to put those back up, or you can go to this uh, site in your browser and experience the slowness that is this. It was probably faster on the original hardware. Um, um, and yeah, with that, I think that's basically my talk. Um, so are there any questions? I think uh, we have time for a few, maybe. We'll take questions. Uh, or Come over here, come line up over here. And please remember to keep your question in the form of a question. So I know you said it's really slow and it's a Tadakan and everything, but like why is it so slow? Uh, it's so slow because it is, it hasn't really been written for speed in mind at this point. Like it was written to be as complete as possible as we could like a first kind of run through of JavaScript a JavaScript interpreter in Python, and the goal would be like once it's a little bit more complete, we could then focus on speed and try to see if we can, you know, get the JIT to work a little bit better and get it. But really, that just wasn't the goal. The goal was just could we could we eventually just have it so that you could do scripts type equals text slash Python and run some Python code like that. That's the goal. Um, it's not quite there yet. Um, speed is an eventual goal, but I think I think the lack of speed just makes this funnier. So. Any other questions for Dr. Christopher Swinson? Oh, all right, come on over. Uh, will it run under Electron? Uh, I'm sure it would. I don't see any reason why I wouldn't. It's running on Chrome now, so and it doesn't do anything with the file system. It's all in pure JavaScript. Cool. So there's, there's no interaction with file systems or anything. It should run fine in Electron. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> look, look for the itch.io release coming soon. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll release this on itch.io is, is the fun thing. I'll, uh, I think there are some bugs that will actually prevent you from beating the game because I don't think anybody has and I, th and I realized I saw like a, a stack trace in, in, in the back end at one point a few, a few weeks ago that I haven't fixed yet because um, it just, yeah, who, who's going to play this tip completion? But so, I don't know, if I release it on itch.io, I'd try to like maybe clean it up and make it actually beatable. Yeah, hi, um, yes. over here. Um, would it have been quicker to go through another interpreter? So I was just thinking that there's been a few Fortran interpreters, but uh, the only one I knew of was a C one, but would it have been quicker? Uh, so, good question. So the question was, uh, would it have been quicker to go through another like Fortran interpreter? As far as I could find when I did my initial research, which was very quick, uh, there is almost no Fortran 4 interpreters or compilers. Like, you can, you can boot up a full PDP-10 emulator and you can run the original compiler maybe, if you're very lucky, but I could not find even a modern compiler that would run Fortran 4. Fortran 77, yes, but Fortran 4 with the weird PDP-10, like 36-bit integers, which aren't really well-defined, and like, it has a random number generator that it pulls from PDP-10. Like, that was all very custom to the PDP-10. I couldn't find anything that did all of that. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Come on up. Okay, come on up. Thanks for making me walk. Okay, uh, you mentioned that really epic token parsing code that was mind-boggling and quite fantastic. Have you documented this somewhere in your repository because I would like to spend a lot of time reading that sort of like magic. Uh, no, but it, the code is in the repository for this talk, I believe. I can't, I don't have my have you, network up uh, right now, but. As in, have you, would you be willing to write an explanation oh. of how that works with the knowledge you have in your brain? Oh, sure, yeah, that could be fun. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Like, like, remind me after this to, uh, and I'll try to put it on my infinite queue of things to do. Okay, that's all the time we have. We have a gift for you. Thank you so much. And let's have another round of applause.